So, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Um, first, um, a short message. Uh, if you were looking for Miller Schrunchich's talk about missing Wikipedia, that's now in the Cinematheque. You know, there are two versions of our schedule, the big one and the small one. The small one is more up to date, so there might be some mix up here. Uh, we have a busy schedule of four uh, talks within one and a half hours, even less. Um, they are kind of loosely connected. Um, their shared theme is conflicts, though in very different senses of that word and different meanings. Um, and we will start with a talk by uh, Dror Kamir, of, uh, here from Israel, uh, from the Hebrew Wikipedia. And this will be a prov provocative talk that will show you where, where Wikipedia has gone wrong. Uh, I hope he won't uh, uh, throw rotten tomatoes at him. <laughs> so Dror, yeah, please, uh, okay. please everyone, uh, let's be punctual because we have to finish on time and we have lots to hear. Okay, hello. So, okay, uh, I've been to several Wikimanias, as you know, and uh, I'm on home ground now, but I feel much more tired than uh, in every previous Wikimania, because this time I'm both the or an organizer and the presenter and the participant, but, uh, um, okay, this is, uh, um, this is going to be a critical, uh, um, observation about uh, the trends and, and uh, the trends of uh, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia in uh, recent years, and I'm talking mainly about uh, the English language Wikipedia. Although I think it is relevant also to the Hebrew language Wikipedia and the German language Wikipedia. I don't speak German, but at least according to some uh, uh, essays I read about them. And I'm going to talk mainly about um, the use of sources, and it also relates to, to the resolution of conflicts on Wikipedia, because uh, in recent years we often hear this uh, saying that we should rely on sources, and if we rely on sources, then we are bound to be neutral, and or at least we are bound to, uh, uh, to resolve conflicts better, because reliable sources uh, are the best to verify our information. And what I want to show is that uh, it's not exactly the case. So I started, uh, I, I decided to start with this quote, uh, which I found in a debate about Israel, uh, about the status of Jerusalem. And someone said that uh, neutral is a matter of perspective which is a kind of a paradoxical statement, but um, okay, if you look at it a bit more closely, then um, you see what he says basically is neutral is a matter of, pers of perspective. What isn't, isn't neutral to you or I may be neutral to someone else. Certainly the BBC or NBC isn't considered neutral in the Muslim world. Uh, if we are going to question the neutrality, um, uh, of Jerusalem. Basically what he says that if we're going to rely on these sources when we question the status of Jerusalem, then we did, didn't solve anything because uh, the basic notion of, of neutrality here is, uh, is, in, is um, in conflict between, between the <laughs> conflicting sides, so to speak. And basically, um, you know, these are the three main uh, principles that govern editing uh, on Wikipedia since its very beginning. The neutral point of view, the verifiability, and the uh, no original research principles, which I suppose you all know very well. And at least at the beginning of Wikipedia in 2001, uh, the neutral point of view was unofficially regarded as uh, the most uh, crucial principle uh, that should be given precedence over other principles. Uh, around 2006, or to be more specific, it became, uh, on the English Wikipedia, it became official on, on October 2006. 
uh, the verif verifiability pr uh, principle, or in other words, sourcing, uh, became the major principle. And you can see here the formulation of the uh, NPOV principle as it was in 2001, and at least the lead of, of the article about this principle from around October 2006. And, okay, let's see the difference here. Okay, in 2001, basically, it said that uh, the neutral point of view attempts to present ideas and facts in such a fashion that both supporters and opponents can agree. Of course, 100% agreement is not possible. There are ide uh, ideologues uh, in the world who will not concede to any uh, presentation other than a forceful statement of their own point of view. We can only seek a type of writing that is agreeable to essentially rational people who may differ on particular points. What's interesting about this phrasing is the emphasis on agreement. Not, no, it's not exactly consensus, it doesn't have to encompass all, uh, all editors, but basically there should be agreement about the content, about the way the content is presented between uh, the two conflicting parties, if there are conflicti conflicting parties, and there often are. And the process of uh, reaching a neutral point of view is basically negotiation between two parties until we reach, um, uh, until we reach a description that both parties can live with. And there is also a simple test. If you can read the article and you don't know what's the opinion of the people uh, who wrote it, and you also, no matter what your opinion is, you feel comfortable with this description, then it is probably NPOV or neutral. Now, in October 2006, you see that uh, the formulation or the, the phrasing of, this, of the principle changed dramatically into, and this is just the lead, but the rest is quite similar, it's just uh, details of this lead. Editing from a neutral point of view means representing fairly, proportionally, and as far as possible without bias, all significant views that have been published by reliable sources. Now, I think the, the last sentence is the most crucial one here, because it subdues the uh, notion of neutrality to the notion of sourcing. Now, sources uh, are quite useful when you want to verify facts. They are not so useful when you try to decide how to describe these facts, how to interpret them, which interpretation to present, and what way to give, what weight to give uh, to uh, each opinion or each interpretation. And, but there are more problems with this uh, uh, formulation, with this phrasing. Uh, first of all, the reference to collaborative work has been removed, which is quite interesting because Wikipedia is has always presented itself as uh, being the product of collaborative work. And the idea of reaching neutrality through collaborative work, at least in my opinion, was very appealing to many people, and here it's gone. There is also use of equivocal terms, like fairly, proportionally, how exactly you define, what exactly the meaning of these words in this context. It's not exactly clear, at least not to me. And there is also a tautological statement here, namely that um, yeah, when you say that neutrality is a uh, um, presentation which is as far as possible without bias, that's basically like a dictionary definition of the term. It doesn't really give you direction on how to write in a neutral way. Now, as I said, the most interesting uh, thing about this change is, the, uh, is subjecting or subduing, uh, subduing the uh, NPOV principle to the sourcing principle. 
um, just a minute, I'll get back to, no, okay. And this is, by, this is another, uh, uh, this is by the way the NPOV text which I took from Wikibooks rather than, um, rather than Wikipedia. And I think in Wikibooks they didn't change their NPOV uh, uh, principle, the description of their NPOV principle since the beginning of Wikibooks. And you see uh, again how different it is. It is much more similar uh, to the first phrasing of the principle on the English Wikipedia. And you also see an interesting statement here that neutral point of view should not be confused with point of view espoused by an international body such as the United Nations. Which is uh, again interesting because recently on the English Wikipedia I see many times people saying uh, but this uh, opinion is supported by international organization and more specifically the UN, so uh, it must be neutral. And on Wikibooks it says specifically that this is not the case, or at least it is not necessarily the case, uh, while on Wikipedia, on the English Wikipedia at least, uh, let's say the, the spirit is totally different nowadays. And also, um, this is taken from the Meta, from uh, uh, the Meta website of Wikimedia, which governs or which introduces principle of all uh, projects. And you see here also this uh, equivocal tone, which is fairly new, I think. The ability of almost anyone to edit most articles without registration. This almost and most um, in my opinion, uh, present a kind of withdrawal or, uh, yes, you could th say it's a withdrawal from uh, uh, earlier principles. Now, uh, I, just, I wondered to myself, and I thought it might interest you too, uh, what caused this change? I mean, what was, what was wrong with the principles uh, in 2001 and why uh, were they phrased differently? And I think this phrasing also have a significant influence on the articles themselves. And I took this quote from uh, Jimmy Wells, uh, an interview he gave to a website on uh, June 2005. And he said very frankly, and I admire this um, uh, honesty, and I think this is the way it should be. Overall, Wikipedia is not perfect, but surprisingly good. He mentioned here the uh, a research in Germany comparing between Encarta, which is a very uh, well-established traditional encyclopedia, and Wikipedia, and uh, he says that this research uh, found that Wikipedia was even better, more accurate. Um, but then again, he says that uh, Wikipedia is not flawless, and we all know that it isn't. And yet, uh, Wikipedia came under a huge criticism on, uh, about its accuracy, mainly from those who uh, edit traditional uh, encyclopedia. And I brought here, um, this was the statement published by Encyclopedia Britannica after a similar research to the one uh, that has been done in Germany, has been done also by The Nature uh, magazine, and found out that basically Britannica and Wikipedia are more or less the same in terms of accuracy or in terms of um, errors, how many errors you find. And uh, well, I'm not sure, I don't know how reliable this research was and, and Britannica um, criticized this heavily and, and in, in many, with many details about flaws in the research, but uh, I'm interested in their response. They say, uh, in rebutting nature's work, we in no way mean to imply that Britannica is error free. And they also said, um, our editors work uh, unceasingly to revise and improve the encyclopedia, and we work with thousands of contributors and advisors around the world, uh, scholars and experts all, and maintain a brisk uh, correspondence with our readers as well. 
Now, Britannica criticized Wikipedia um, to the point that I think one of them said that reading Wikipedia is a bit like uh, visiting uh, a public toilet because you never know who was there before you. Uh, that was one of their analogies or metaphors, uh, which is quite harsh. And yet, in their statement, they, they give a very similar statement to the one Jimmy Wells gave. Uh, they admit that Britannica is not error-free, and we assume that it's not. And they also acknowledge that as much contributors you have, the better the encyclopedia is. Now, they maintain that they're, that they're using only experts, they're receiving information only from experts, but then again, they don't really define what experts mean, and um, also we know that experts write on Wikipedia too. Um, I mean, at least educated people uh, usually write on Wikipedia. So basically, um, both sides agree that uh, if you have many editors, and if you maintain good contact with uh, the public, then you have a better uh, encyclopedia, which is uh, very important, in my opinion. And um, what, uh, what concerns me is that Wikipedia, and I think that the result of the criticism on it, became more of Britannica, in a way. I don't know if Britannica became more like Wikipedia. Uh, they did change some of their editing uh, methods um, as an influence of Wikipedia. But what concerns me that uh, Wikipedia has become more like Britannica. Because when you say, for example, and, and this is also from, uh, from the uh, phrasing of the principle uh, of verifiability on Wikipedia, when you say that the threshold for inclusion on Wikipedia is, uh, is not truth but verifiability, and that verifiability means um, giving citation from reliable sources, then basically you mean that the person who writes on Wikipedia should have access to academic resources or uh, um, to established written resources. Now, we all know that uh, the accessibility to these sources is not trivial. It, co it often costs money, and it also requires uh, uh, knowing the professional language uh, that these um, articles are written in. And it also requires a lot um, of uh, critical reading uh, that is taught in universities. I mean, you need to know that uh, if you read an article by an author in 2005, then maybe he said something else in 2006. And you need to know that often there are responses to this article which may contradict uh, uh, what's written in it. And basically, uh, there is a lot of, of, um, of methodology that you have to uh, acquire uh, if the condition is uh, relying on sources. And I think uh, the main advantage of Wikipedia, the fact that first and foremost it looks for facts on the ground, uh, facts that are given by people, uh, is lost here in, in, the new, in the new policy since 2006. And uh, I can give you an example. Well, I have, uh, uh, I have on my computer a nice software that shows the shape of the moon each evening. And at some point I thought that this is a silly program because you can open the window and see the shape of the moon. And I think that Wikipedia, on its beginning, uh, told people to look outside the window and report what they see. And then, if there is a conflict about the facts, I mean, if people think that these facts is not uh, reliable enough, then they can consult sources or maybe um, uh, look for another person who could give another opinion. And finally, they would describe these facts as neutrally as, as possible in a way that would be agreed by both, by both sides. 
Today, what we are telling people is look for written materials, and basically um, that that won't solve their problem because. Uh, if they argue about the facts, then the best thing would be to look, as I said, to look out of the window and see what's out there. And if, there are, uh, uh, if their conflict is about the description of the facts, then uh, sources won't help because each source would give its own opinion. And so you have sources that have one opinion and another source that have another opinion, and you just uh, drag this conflict endlessly, because eventually you have to decide uh, which source is reliable. And, and again, and th this is an endless conflict. And if you look at, um, I'll skip some, because we don't have enough time, so I'll skip uh, some points. But we have this arbitration committee, which is supposed to, um, um, to control these conflicts. Uh, and you see that most problems that brought before this arbitration committee are not factual problem, but problem of opinion, of how to describe opinions. So for example, should abortion be defined as a process in which the embryo is removed or destroyed? This is certainly not a matter of fact. Both agree that the embryo is not there at the end of the process. But the word destroyed is, more, is stronger. And therefore, uh, it is more appealing to the people who object abortions. Uh, or if you look, should the country in the Balkans should be called Macedonia, Republic Macedonia, or the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia? These are not, these are not matter of facts. Everyone agrees that there is a country there. The question is how it should be described. And therefore, um, what you see in most cases is the, that the arbitration committee uh, resorts to this kind of statement. In this case, this is a statement uh, about uh, some edit wars on uh, issues related to the Middle East. But as far as I could see, this is usually these kind of statements are usually the result of the arbitration, and this doesn't lead us uh, anywhere because okay, we knew that. Uh, and there is also, um, and, and, since, and since the arbitration committee uh, basically cannot and doesn't want to uh, decide which source is more reliable or which opinion is uh, more significant, then what they do is they, they start to talk about the people and not about the content. And this is something that uh, Ayelet Oz, for example, uh, observed uh, very well in, in, uh, in her research about Wikipedia. So, just one more minute, and so, first of all, we talk about people, and then we're having these pseudo uh, trials. I mean, you behaved improperly, and so you will be blocked, and therefore, uh, indirectly, the opinion of the person who was in conflict with you would prevail, because you are blocked, and this is in my opinion, certainly doesn't um, advance Wikipedia because you didn't solve anything. You just punished someone because he was, he was a bit rude, which is not nice, but then again, he might be right even though he is rude. And also, uh, Wikipedians are engaged in hours of pseudo-legal pseudo uh, debates. And personally, I often feel that uh, we, should have, we should have kind of wiki lawyers to represent people and, and to, to, to take this job upon themselves. Because uh, seriously, if, if, I'm, uh, if I encounter such a problem in real life, I would hire a lawyer. And on Wikipedia, I have to become a lawyer in order to make my point. And this is also... Uh, a deplorable uh, development, in my opinion. And so, since I'm out of time, uh, then I'll leave you with uh, these ob observations of mine. And thank you very much. We don't really have time for any questions. I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay.
Okay, so now I'm going to invite Rowan, right? Uh, I messed it up horribly. <laughs> uh, no, Oliver. No, I keep calling him other names. Oliver Keys, please, uh, for a talk called Hippies with Guns, How Ideological Conflict Shapes Wikipedia and What We Can Learn From It. Uh, and don't worry, I've been called much meaner things than that. <laughs> By me too. <laughs> Thank you. I had no idea you people were that easy to get applause from. <laughs> if I did, I would never have bothered. <laughs> okay, so I have to start this with uh, two things. Uh, firstly, the statement that user Quantical, uh, who is currently on NWiki, is um, an unrepentant reprobate. And if you are not sitting on IRC, that will have no sense attached to it whatsoever. <laughs> the second is a disclaimer. Um, in case you can't tell, I'm British. This means that my presentation will contain British humour. Uh, <laughs> since I appreciate that some people find British humour quite hard to detect, there's an easy way to understand it. So my presentation will be a combination of uh, facts and jokes. If there's something that uh, you don't find funny, that was a fact. <laughs> and if there's something that you don't agree with, that was a joke. <laughs> and. <laughs> Any of you who didn't understand that should probably leave now because you'll have a very boring 20 minutes ahead of you. Okay, so the presentation is rather interestingly titled Hippies with Guns. Now, this is not because that's what I feel our user base is. It's because it's um, combining sort of the most extreme elements of the two common tags we're given. We're either, you know, left-wing ideologues or we're crazy fundamentalists, depending on, you know, who's disagreeing with us that day. Um, how ideological conflicts shapes Wikipedia. Uh, that's not a very good title. It would have been a good title at the beginning, but after dealing with this issue for a long period of time, I, I sort of changed my focus. I changed what my presentation would be about. Um, something better would be uh, how the super subjective uh, collective opinion of Wikipedians allows Wikipedia to become an atmosphere in which problems can be easily fixed or magnified, but that wouldn't be as catchy. So I kind of left it. Okay, so this can be summarized as a history of Wikipedia that looks at what the ideological reasoning behind major decisions are and what the background to those decisions are and therefore whether the precipice we're standing on now can be fixed not through massive fundamental changes in the community or external pressure but instead through precisely the tools that got us to this situation in the first place. And the mouse isn't plugged in. One moment. There we are. Okay, so there are generally, in my opinion, four stages in the evolution of Wikipedia. The first I just called a community of tech heads, which lasted from 2001 to 2003. Uh, the second, Eternal September, was 2003 to 2006. Uh, I would point out that Sue actually used the same name in her March 2011 update, but I used it earlier, so, you know. Uh, the third stage, ossification and conflict from 2006 to 2008. And the fourth stage, paradigm shift, which is where we've been from 2008 to the present. So, tech heads. Um, in the beginning, there was nothingness. And then Jimbo created the stars, and someone reverted him on the grounds that they didn't agree what color the stars should be. <laughs> it didn't start like that, but it may as well have. So, Wikipedia was founded in 2001 with seven editors. And in the early days, it was a very small community. And by 2003, for example, there were only 1,500 editors, i.e. people who had made more than five edits, and there were only 4,000 total accounts. 
And this actually made things easier because the sort of people who would be attracted to the encyclopedia in its early days when it didn't have much to offer people besides its open and free nature were survivors of you know the 60s counterculture movement they were largely tech heads or FOSS nerds or members of the copyleft movement they were the sort of people who were used to an environment in which you know there weren't real structured rules you just you, you did what felt right and if something went badly, you know, you could fix it because it's Wikipedia. It's free and open and everything is changeable. And this allowed for very, very loose role, uh, rules. And it was aided by the size of the community itself, not just the nature of the people in it. Because when you've only got, you know, a, a thousand at its peak editors, it's quite easy to just conduct business by mailing list. If you have a dispute with someone, you don't need fixed rules because you probably know them. I mean, you've probably met up with them for a pint or you know them from other projects or, you know, you've dealt with them on Wiki before. The second stage, Eternal September. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the term, uh, back when Usenet was a thing, uh, yes, a long time ago, um, Eternal September was the name for the period in which college students would start university because they would go to university and their computers would be loaded with um, Usenet access and they would storm onto Usenet um, in complete ignorance of the informal and unspoken conventions which everyone on Usenet understood and generally from the old people's point of view make a mess. And Eternal September comes from um, the idea that as the, universe, uh, the internet became you know, more readily available, you always had that influx of people coming along, not just every September, but constantly. And from 2003 to 2006, that's kind of what happened with Wikipedia. We got a lot of new people coming along. So uh, December 2003 was the first month in which over a thousand new editors started. And that was the beginning of this period, which was a very exciting period in Wikipedia. Um, but also, as hopefully I'll show, the one that set the seeds for what we're dealing with now. So, the expansion of the community to deal with the increased number of editors meant that things had to change. You could no longer conduct all your business by mailing list. That simply wasn't appropriate. I mean, it's impossible to coordinate a mailing list with 1,000 members on it, let alone one where 1,000 are joining every month. So instead, things moved more and more on Wiki, and to compensate for the influx of newbies uh, having no knowledge of the informal, unspoken conventions, more and more things became uh, codified. Now, this was done, uh, as some might find it amusing, given where we are now, this was done with the intention of helping the newbies who had previously been quite um, confused and hurt by having to deal with you know, rules they didn't really understand because they were new. Um, the third stage, ossification and conflicts. Now, this was almost sort of an expansion of the second. So, account creation continued to increase dramatically. Uh, new pages also hit a peak. We had peaks of around 2,000 a month, which were created and stayed. And the rules and policies, which had started in the early eternal September period, continued to uh, expand in this never-ending tide of bureaucracy, because the people who had joined during that period, who were now elder statesmen of the wiki, had grown up with that, almost. They saw that as natural, the idea of codified rules and the idea of the abeyance of common sense in favour of, um, you know, following policy as it is written in the great code laid down by that god consensus. Uh, and this is interestingly uh, indirectly and anecdotally reflected by some statistics which the foundation gathered, which show that the 2007 editors, i.e. the people who joined through this in this period, at the height of this period, and are therefore most likely to be used to the expansion of policy, are also the ones who stay around the most and do the most work. So the fourth and final stage is uh, where we are now, and that is a paradigm shift. Um, We've understood that we have some serious problems, and this is because from 2008 onwards, new editor numbers began to noticeably decrease. I say noticeably because the problems which led to this happening were not brand new problems. It's probable that uh, the new user numbers were retarded by these rules previously, but we had so many coming in that you know, nobody noticed. It's impossible to predict potential growth with any sense of accuracy. Uh, new article creation also began to decrease. 
and the result was that we found ourselves in a very difficult situation because we were losing people and losing potential people. Now, to their credit, the foundation has acknowledged this for a very long time. So the top risks report produced by the audits uh, committee of the board of trustees in 2009 listed uh, the driving off of new editors or the making it very difficult for new editors to enter the community as one of the top concerns. And when I say top, I mean other ones included the foundation losing its protection against being sued. So this is a big issue in their point of view. Uh, similarly, you've had a lot of research done, such as the Editor Trends Survey, which again uh, showed that there had been a marked decline in the 2005 to 2007 period, um, while retention of existing editors remained strong. Uh, and you've had some practical efforts, such as the WikiGuides project, which uh, James Alexander spoke about earlier in the cinema room, which is was an attempt to you know, pair up new editors with experienced ones to guide, guide them through the minefield of rules that is you know, policy. And you also have Ryan Caldari's Wikilove extension, which in my experience is mainly used for trolling, but I gather that they've gathered useful data from it. However, the problem is that even though we know we have an issue, and the foundation has recognized it, the community in some respects haven't. We've had a lot of things which don't indicate that the community sees this as an issue or that they're willing to follow the obvious concerns from up top that it's something we need to deal with. So we've got a board resolution on keeping the community as open as possible, and yet we've had a proposal to make it more and more difficult for new users to create articles out of a desire to protect the existing status quo and the existing users. And I think in some ways this is inevitable because when, you're, when you've been around since 2007, you can't see things from the new user's perspective necessarily because you've lost empathy. You don't remember what it was like to be a new user. You can't feel their pain in any great detail. So there is a sort of resulting lack of concern. And at the same time, the, the calling card of uh, the people who don't see this as an issue has been, well, I struggled through our system, I managed to succeed, and therefore it can't be a problem for anyone else, which is both very limiting and also incorrect because it assumes that policy has remained static since they joined, when it hasn't. I think we all know that it's been bloating and bloating, and it assumes that the users we're dealing with are the same users. And make no mistake, they're not. This is not the 2001 to 2003 copyleft activists and, you know, FOSS nerds crowd. These are people who are in the Facebook generation. These are people who don't necessarily want to see under the hood, or to use David Gerrard's metaphor, they don't want to look inside the sausage factory. They don't want to see the gruesome details of how things are made. They just want things to work. And I think it's important to remember that... These problems came about because of the strongest element of the Wikimedia community, and that is that things are done by consensus, that there is no such thing as natural law, that there is no such thing as overriding rules. The rules that we have are shaped by the people who we have in the community, by their concerns, by what they want the rules to be. When the people in the community didn't want strict rules, we didn't have strict rules. When people in the community thought we needed strict rules, we did. And this means that all, although we've got these problems, the community are actually, despite the work of the foundation, in some ways the best people to solve the problem. Because we know we can do it. We know we can change the social structure of Wikipedia. We know we can change the rules. We know we can make it easier for new users to edit because we've done it before or tried to do it. And sure, there were unforeseen side effects, which weren't very pleasant, but you know, it was an attempt nonetheless. And this is quite, I think, an interesting moment in the history and evolution of Wikipedia, just because we're stuck at a fork. We can continue to do things the old way, and we can watch us gradually die as a project. Or we can step into the unknown. We can say, yes, in some ways we lack empathy. Yes, in some ways these things don't appear to be in our best interests, at least in the short term. But we want the communities to survive. Because whether you joined in 2001, 2003, 2005, whenever you joined, you joined because you wanted Wikipedia to be a long-lasting free resource of educational encyclopedic content. 
not just for yourself, but for your friends and your family and future generations. That is why we are here, and that is why the new users are here too. And if we want to keep going as a project that is available for the people we care about and for future generations and for anyone else who may crop up, then we need to make some changes. And we have it in us to make those changes. We just need to step into the unknown. Any questions? <laughs> Yes, you in the blue shirt with the beard. That doesn't narrow it down, I know, but... <laughs> I think it's simply been implying that the main reason driving people away is how they need to work in order to write an article. Whereas I'm suggesting that what it is that they may write is at least as important, I believe, much more. And I believe that a current censorship in the Wikipedia community is driving away people, potential people, much more than the difficulty of writing HTML. And outside, right now, we have tents that constitute one part of the Israeli um, ongoing uh, internal struggle on economics. However, the Hebrew Wikipedia article for the leader of that movement is currently under debate and voting to be deleted from the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Wikipedia because it is unimportant for Hebrew Wikipedia. And I, I suggest that the idea, and we had a presentation yesterday with the German Wikipedia where people, I don't know, seven times tried to write a, 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 an article about a person who they felt was important, but the in crowd decided that the person is not important enough. And I'm suggesting that if Wikipedia does not stop the censorship, it does not open up to any topic that anyone wants to talk and to present, and only limit it to the things and interests and politics of the in crowd, it will definitely break down regardless of how easy we do we editing system to uh, Without going into the specifics, I do agree that there is a problem uh, of things being considered notable or things being considered reliable uh, based on what the in-crowd thinks. It's systematic bias and we've known it's a problem for a long time. Um, but I wasn't just trying to say that a lack of a WYSIWYG editor is making things difficult. I was saying that the complex rules, which involve notability, makes things difficult. Um, I can't address your specific concern because I'm not a Hebrew Wikipedia editor, but uh, generally I firmly believe that regardless of um, the other attitudes or approaches of the article or the subject of the article or the writer of the article, we need to uh, apply precisely the same notability standard to everything because neutral point of view does not just come through what is found in our articles, it comes through the approach we take to the people who try to write them. Without going into too much detail, again, just because there are other people who want to ask questions, um, notability is not an indicator of importance. This is something I try and impress everywhere I go. Notability has no relation to importance whatsoever. Notability ensures, or the basic notability guideline, is meant to ensure that the content we have is verifiable. Importance doesn't come into it. If someone is unimportant but passes the notability guidelines, then that should be fine. Um. Yourself? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I agree with the idea that we should, we should continue to delete articles on pet guinea pigs and so forth. And we do need some sort of notability criteria to avoid being buried by crap. But you raised an issue about um, the problem is, is consensus and that, that consensus has taken us to where we are. And I would just point out that one of the things we learned with, with, with things like uh, Newt and so forth on, on, on the English Wikipedia is that we've got an awful lot of people who are actually deleting things out of consensus. We've got rogue admins who will delete stuff out of process. And the, the, the problem is, it's, in a way, it's too easy to delete. And a lot of stuff gets deleted that, frankly, doesn't actually meet the deletion criteria that, that consensus is based on. Just an observation. OK. Uh, anyone else? OK, quick, because we're running out of time, and those are like um, very I old like debates well, for everything. I know, ah. um, I, I've heard a lot about why there are no new editors from, uh, in various contexts in this conference. 
Um, and, and nobody has mentioned what is obvious, which is that, I mean, the reason I'm an editor in the Wikipedia is that five or six years ago, I was looking for information about Ignaz Schupanzig, and I looked in the Wikipedia, and there was nothing there. So I wrote an article about Ignaz Schupanzig. Now, if I were to do the same thing today, I would have nothing to write, because there already is an article about Ignaz Schupanzig, which is an ex excellent article, by the way. <laughs> I, I agree that the whole um, Africa is not a red link phenomenon is creating issues, but there is still a lot to write. I mean, we have requested, page, uh, requested articles pages, which are hundreds and hundreds of entries long. Um, I think the problem is twofold. Firstly, yes, there are less things to write, and this drives away those who might not have uh, subject-specific knowledge for the various things which don't have good content. But secondly, we make it so difficult for somebody to get into the community that we're even driving those away who do have subject-specific knowledge. Um, there's not necessarily much we can do about the first, but the second we can tackle. Okay. Yeah. Apparently yeah. that's it. Yeah. The, the <laughs> Yeah, so I'm happy to invite uh, Emmanuel Vatelet and Francois Lambert, I hope I got it right, uh, to tell us about how rules and resources constrain social memory on Wikipedia, the case of the 2011 Japan earthquake. You're doing it yourself, just you? Uh, where is the use? There something? Somewhere? Well, <clears throat> I would like you to know that I'm not British. Um, it means that uh, I'm Belgian, so my English is very poor. And what's more, I'm not funny at all, but uh, <laughs> I will do my best, OK? Um, the analysis that I present today is only a part of a larger research on the origins of rules on Wikipedia. Um, I know everybody knows about the rules because we uh, have already sp spoken a lot about um, rules right now, so I will, I will begin. Um, <clears throat> the English Wikipedia article on the earthquake in Japan this year is the material of my study. It's an academic study, so um, maybe it's a little bit different. Um, from what we have um, already seen. We had two main objectives for our research. For, first of all, to this question, to what extent the rules do they influence construction of memory? And secondly, what are the um, characteristics of memory in, on Wikipedia? But these questions require to define the memory, especially the memory on Wikipedia. And a definition that can be given is that memory on Wikipedia is short-term, disorganized, and unstable. Well, it is short-term and disorganized because content changes or can change, could change constantly. It is disorganized in the sense uh, the, the organization depends on individual priorities. Um, I mean, the organization does not exist prior to the content. But Wikipedia is also distanced, fixed, objectified, and specialized. We have already spoken um, about this rule, uh, neutral point of view. Well, um, neutral point of view leads to some objectivity. I mean, this is the challenge. And we can also say that quality content remains. And finally, we see two types of uh, specialization, logically enough, on content, but that's more important, according to me, uh, spe specialization on the organizational dynamics of Wikipedia. So two definitions, two definitions very different, and two definitions that seem to conflict. That's why I try to find what made this possible. How could something be and not be at the same time? I would say it's a philosophical question. And um, this is where I became interested in development and the role played by the rules. So um, rules would be the main tool of a socially regulated history, history partly built uh, thanks to the rules. 
According to Ferron and Massin, Wikipedia has memorial dimension. They focus on the pages talking about traumatic events, and they found Wikipedians participate much more during anniversaries. For instance, each year in September, um, there are many Wikipedians who uh, participate to um, the article uh, about 9-11. According to these authors, it would prove the role played by Wikipedia as a global memory place. But the lack of symbolism associated with this participation requires us to question this idea. What's more, there is a rule that contradicts this memorial dimension. We can see uh, right there, and this rule is sometimes uh, convened uh, in the talk pages. But well, <clears throat> we can say Wikipedia is also a memory, a memory place in a much broader sense. Uh, for Christian Penzel, for instance, it's a memory place because uh, negotiation is about what should be remembered and how it should be remembered. So after memory, we can ask the question of history. Because we see the question of memory is not easy, and above all, it's a question of definition. For the French theorist uh, Pierre Nora, our time is no longer that of memory, but of history. He said that with the appearance of the trace, of mediation, of distance, we are not in the realm of true memory, but of history. And his critique culminates when he says that modern memory is above all archival. So just one minute, I would like you to think about the incredible, huge amount of archives on Wikipedia and you will understand why the obsession with the archive is typical of our age and in which way we could agree with uh, Pierre Nora. So um, I would say Wikipedia would be somewhere between memory and history. And I think it's a more uh, balanced uh, point of view. Rules. Well, I'm not the first one to um, think about the rules on Wikipedia. Several scholars have already studied rules on Wikipedia. Butler, Pike, and Joyce found that surprisingly, wikis, wiki platforms, facilitate the creation of policies. And those policies serve a wide variety of functions. Firstly, rules are seen as rational efforts to organize and coordinate. In this view, you have to understand, rules are conscious intentional actions put in place for the purpose of improving uh, collective performance. But there is an, another uh, way to think about it, and policies and rules are also evolving, competing entities. And this perspective rejects the idea of invention, design, or agency as the primary drivers of policy development. We can also say rules and policies answer questions about who we are and indicate the way things should be. I mean, it's a question of identity. Of course, policies and policies are also internal signals uh, used for conflict uh, resolutions. We have already seen that. And deletion and blocking are two examples uh, of rules for control mechanisms. So I will conclude this um, part by recalling that the ambiguity of rules leaves spaces for power plays. It means the rule alone is absolutely nothing. <coughs> Qualitative analysis has the advantage, in this case, to go further into details. As I said before, we studied in depth the talk page section of the earthquake article. This choice corresponds to a specific type of um, sampling based on the principle of intensity. The case is rich and expresses the phenomenon intensely, but not extremely. Of course, I'm talking about the article, not the event. We applied our analysis to more than 280 threads that we compared and contrast. Three questions that you can read just there allow us to build our categories. Uh, just if you want some example, for the first questions, you had um, types of rules um, placed in the negotiation. And concerning the users, there were newcomers, experienced users, administrators, uh, IPs, and so on. Just some example of categories I built. 
Let's go for uh, the first results. And of course, these results only apply to the study of our case. And it would be interesting to extend the analysis to other articles to enhance complicate or why not to contradict our findings. Um, I'm afraid one case is not enough for that kind of study. I'm conscious. Not surprisingly, we found that nearly three quarters of the discussions involve rules. And the re remaining 27% mainly concerns the addition of content that, for reasons of semi-protection, had to be approved by confirmed users first. In 75% of cases, the rules are explicitly expressed, and in 13% of cases, via hyperlinks. And we'll see later that's a key issue, really. Each discussion convened on average a similar number of rules, about two per thread. However, peaks appear quickly and evolve in frequency and intensity. They represent moments of intense negotiation where rules are used as arguments. At the very beginning, the question is mostly reliability of sources, but after the first few hours, procedural, is procedural issues arise and references to rules are becoming more frequent. At that moment, rules are central to the building of the article. So, very quickly, actions supported by rules are taken against vandalism. The page might be semi-protected. Control of the rules and tools linked up with this knowledge are very, have very concrete effects to ultimately decide on the presence or absence of, in of information in the body of the article. The biggest contributors to the talk pages are the people who convene the rules. However, they are not part of the largest contributors of the page. That's interesting because it suggests that it's possible to exert power ahead of what's published. Long-term active users, because they have the knowledge, and administrators, because they have the tools, both would be favored. We can have a look at this power by uh, showing the role of hyperlinks in controversy. Among the ways to express a rule explicitly, it's possible to write down the rule with the direct link to the policy page. We found that this is done mainly in case of controversy. On the other hand, this practice is only possible for contributors who master the rules. Their abilities can be compared to lawyer abilities. But the danger is that once a rule has been called, it is no longer possible to argue otherwise. Sometimes the rule itself is already a sufficient argument. In turn, the rule can be used as a sentence of a judge or a mediator. The discussion will then focus on the value of rules. That's why I say that from a historical perspective, we move to a historiographical perspective. It means no more discussion about the content, but about history building. It's like a meta discussion. So the first part of my conclusions, with uh, what's new, this is the importance of importance of rules in this um, co-constructions of meaning. The rule is needed to negotiate, but as important as it is, the rule appears explicitly mainly when there is a problem. The rest of the time, it is internalized. Newcomers can always participate, but in reality, the risk is great that in case of controversy, the argument won't be enough. So it's really a big challenge and a key issue, I think. Rules allow improvement of the content quality, but they could scare newcomers, newcomers in the same time. So let's finish by a new definition of what I call socially regulated history. 
A socially regulated history questions itself as much as it questions the content, its history, and at the same time, a meta-history. In this process, how explicit a rule is depends on how we want it to be enforceable. And the figures show that in a controversy, citing the rule can succeed. Rules lead to specialization. This is in contradiction with the idea that everyone could contribute. That's why my final word is policies and guidelines are wonderful tools, as well as maybe one of the biggest dangers for the project. Thank you. So I understand the mechanism by which talk page consensus and discussions govern what's actually going on in the article, but when we get that slide up there that says the, you know, the, the heavy rules editors are contributing a large amount to the, the, the talk page and contributing very little to the article page, um, how can you convince me that that is entirely due to their, or that is largely due to their political control or their control via the rules of the, talk, of, the, of the article page, rather than those editors which may be more inclined to talk about the rules, to hear themselves talk, um, for lack of a better term, bring themselves on the talk page and fill the talk page up with you know, nonsense and that action on the article page continues apace. Well, um, you're absolutely uh, right. I agree with you. The fact is, what I realized is there is m more and more uh, quite of specialist of rules. Um, so, well, I, I agree. I, with I, you. I, no, I, I, I wasn't making a comment. I mean, are, 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 I'm, look, I'm asking if there are specific mechanisms that you were looking at in the Fukushima article that you saw that corroborated that argument. I'll, I'll talk with you later. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, you talk before, and there is someone else there. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, you said that in the article, uh, many times when they brought up rules, they used hyperlinks. But uh, if a newcomer tries, do you think that there's an actual correlation between using the hyperlink, showing this is the policy and this is the reason why my argument is correct, and just actually presenting that same argument that is in the policy, uh, only not actually hyperlinking to it. For example, if a newcomer uh, will understand uh, the concept of neut neutrality, but doesn't link to NPOV, will his argument still, uh, still come through? Or was it just people just were actually looking for those hyperlinks? Actually, it happens. Newcomers uh, sometimes try to, um, to argue by hyperlinks. The fact is, what I realized, uh, but I do not have figures to, to show, uh, what I realized that in that case, um, experienced users will find, uh, will go further into details, into details of the rules. Oh, back there. Uh, can you shout? <laughs> Good. Please come here. By the way, is Milos here already? No? He's our next speaker. Okay, so we have some time. He gave up, so we have no first. We can take our time. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, well, I actually wrote a I actually wrote a, well, an essay, I suppose it is, about uh, uh, not just putting links to you know, new users, but actually explaining what you're saying. Uh, WP, W O O T A on the English Wikipedia. And I'm not going to give you the full length uh, title. It's uh, what the fuck, uh, too many damn uh, acronyms. I'm sorry, I didn't but understand what you said. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, very good. So people, uh, people often use these uh, links as shibboleths. 
Um, but my question to you right now is, uh, so when, when, a, when you see uh, this interaction with people linking, they only ever go into the content of the rules. Do you ever see anybody actually disagreeing with the content of the rules and suggesting they may, must be modified? Um, no, I don't think so, but... Um, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I think I have done it once or twice. It didn't end very, I mean... Because that's how consensus... It's not the right, the right, right way uh, thing to do in order to win an argument, I mean... I actually do it, I, I do it all the time, but that's because I also wrote consensus, the article, or maintained it at least, so... But... Well, that's too bad, but thanks for your... Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, firstly, an interesting study, but I think um, the, the average Wikipedia article would be very different, partly because um, only something like one in a thousand are semi-protected. So you're, you're looking at an article which has an intense view at a particular moment in time and it wound up semi-protected, and the 99 point something percent of, argument, uh, of, of articles and probably 90 percent of, of discussion would be on, on ones where semi-protection wouldn't apply. Um, <clears throat> that's one observation. The other observation, and um, I ha I'm not familiar with that article, but I suspect that the, the case would be that if you, you'd actually div you could divide into effectively three groups of editors on there. Um, one group are the, the admins and, and so on who are protecting it against people um, who are doing non-encyclopedic stuff, not necessarily vandalism, but saying, um, trying to say how, oh, this, isn't this a disaster, rather than just saying this is an a, a eruption, etc. The people who are quietly getting on with adding in the, the seismic survey bits and the oceanography bits and sections of that article, which will be growing with people who don't bother to go to the talk page. They don't need to. They're writing up the bit about uh, how the oceanography interrelates with that, and, and people are letting them get on with that section because nobody else knows what they're talking about anyway. Um, and the third group of the newbies coming to Wikipedia, and every time you get a natural disaster like this, there'll be a bunch of completely new editors coming to Wikipedia, and part of what has to happen is that you have to explain to a lot of them what the new rules are. So. Okay, so that's just, just three observations on there that I just wanted to throw into that. But it's, it's an interesting piece of work. And one last little thing. I think it probably helps if you quote a rule to actually give people a link to that rule so they can work out what you're talking about. The worst thing I believe, but I'd be interested in feedback on that, is saying that's a breach of MPOV without even saying what MPOV is. At least if you link to the thing, people have got a chance to understand what you're talking about. But if you're talking to a newbie, you should explain what you're talking about and also give a link. Thank you for your time. I just want to add that um, English Wikipedia is unique in having so many rules with so many acronyms and working on a smaller project like Hebrew Wikipedia, which is not that small by now, but we don't have that number of rules and I find it a good thing. Having hundreds of rules with hundreds of, it's impossible. Uh, okay, so Milos, uh, I'm wrong. Yeah, I know Amir thinks differently. He wants to, us to adopt the pillars of wisdom. <laughs> Let's talk about it later. <laughs> Take it offline, yeah. Um, okay, so Milos uh, was assigned to do two different talks in two parallel sessions. And apparently, he couldn't duplicate himself. <laughs> so, uh, no, but he, he could have made it by here, but apparently, he gave up on this. So uh, basically, you're free for now, but uh, I w uh, <laughs> so <laughs> man. Um, so I, I will just give this one announcement that uh, I'll let you know that we have do have. It's not the end of the day. Uh, you're all invited to a lightning talk session to be held in our bell room at six o'clock. And there is an also an open street map uh, party, which is a bunch of people walking around across Haifa and somehow mapping it. I'm not even sure how they do it. It's interesting. Uh, so if you want to do it, join them. They're creating open source maps, which is wonderful. Um, and if there are any more questions to Dror now, who I, 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 I didn't give the chance to be asked any questions, that's a perfectly good time. 
I see a hand there. So. Thanks. Uh, this is, um, I suppose, a general question for everyone in the hall, since I've got everyone, since everyone is here that is interested in this sort of a topic. Um, I came out of, uh, earlier today I attended um, the conference on the Global South, and there they were talking a lot about